We are in Mark chapter 4. The title of the message is The Church That Throws Shade. But many of you have no idea what that means. I wouldn't know either if it weren't for my friends on ESPN. Because I hear them talking and they say something like this. Um, well, LeBron, he done this and he done that. Somebody else would be, why he be throwing shade on LeBron? And I wouldn't know what throwing shade meant until I heard somebody talking about it. So it means to speak disparagingly of, in our culture today, throwing shade. But I'm in Mark chapter 4. I'm beginning in verse 30. And it says this. Mark 4, verse 30, To what shall we liken the kingdom of God? With what parable shall we par picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when it is sown on the ground, is smaller than all the seeds on the earth. And when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs, and shoots out large branches, so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. So I want to speak to you this morning about the church that throws shade. And in our modern vernacular, those who will think of throwing shade as derogatory, we're going to talk about, Jesus said, the church, the kingdom, provides shade. Say it one more time. What's the kingdom like? Well, it's like a mustard seed. When it's sown in the ground, it's smaller than all the seeds on the earth. But when it's sown, it grows up and becomes greater. So, number one, verse 32, it says it grows, becomes greater, Shoots out large branches. Notice the phrase, the, the, the large branches, that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. So, Father, as we look into your word this morning, I just pray that, God, that we be a people that provide shade. That, God, that, that we would grow, that we would have large branches, and we would provide shade. Father, I ask it this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Now here's the, the principle that, that the larger it gets, the more it is able to produce. That the, the larger the kingdom gets, the more it's able to produce. So it has three applications at least as I look into this passage. The first application of the kingdom of God it is of course the kingdom of God universal. It is the kingdom of God around the planet. That from Jerusalem, a babe, or from Bethlehem, a babe in a manger, to Jerusalem being crucified, resurrected, to the day of Pentecost in the upper room, when the church, 3,000 people are added, and then the church begins to multiply, and it begins to spread throughout the kingdom, throughout the known kingdom, all the way to Rome of the known day, that the church begins to expand. And as the church is expanding, it is growing larger, providing good branches, and being a place of refuge for the disenfranchised and the hurting and those who are, who are separated and, uh, from the kingdom of God and those who are lonely and all of the things that the kingdom of God does, it does on a, on a universal national or international basis. That's the first application. The kingdom of God is growing. It's growing. It's growing. It's growing. It's growing. It's providing shade. The second application then would be the local church in wherever it is locally planted. The local church then also in its local community is reaching and growing and fellowshipping and serving and worshipping and doing all of these things and as it's doing these things, the church is growing and growing and growing and the larger the church gets, the more it can provide for its community. It is necessary that the church would increase because as the church increases, it provides for the community. And then on the third application is the individual application that you, as a believer, you start with the seed of the gospel, but then you begin to mature, and as you mature, you become more and more influential in your particular world. And you provide shade, comfort, strength for those around you, whether you're the head of a household, or whether you're, whether you're a single, or whether you're a child, or whatever. But as you grow, you become more and more influential in your environment. And as you become more mature in Christ, it is necessary that others would come under your shade, under your shelter, 
under your protection. And I mean protection in the sense of they'll turn to you when they're hurting. Every one of you or most of you in the room know what it's like to have someone call you at distressing times in their lives and they call you and ask you for prayer or talk to you, ask you for counsel and the reason that they do is because you have cast some shadow into their life and, you, and so at times of need they look to you for answers. They look to you for encouragement. They look to you for prayer. You may not even realize that they've been looking to you for those things until the call comes. Run into my, into the grocery store. I used to have a guy that made fun of me for being a Christian. He used to mock me a lot, and I would sit and talk to him, and conversations would turn about Christ, and he would make fun and, and mock. And one day, I was in the meat department, uh, and he came to me, and, and I couldn't really understand. He was kind of lingering, and I didn't know what he was doing until finally the other market, the, cut, the cutter walked out, so we were alone, and so he walked over to me and says, could I talk to you for a second? And I said, sure. And he says, uh, I'd like to ask uh, for prayer for my mom. She just got thrown off of a horse, and she's in the hospital, and they're not even sure she will walk again. And, and I just wanted to call and ask you for prayer. And I said, by all means, let's pray together and then pray more. But my point in telling you all of that was I had no idea that morning that that guy was going to come and look for shade. I didn't even realize that I was making an influence. I thought he just looked at me as a joke. And so don't ever forget that the people who mock you or, or make fun of you, or, or they are really watching more than you think they're watching. And they are being influenced more than what you, than you think you're being in, they're being influenced. So the first application is kingdom-wide, internationally. The second application is the local church making impact in its community. And then the third application is your particular area as, as you grow. And so the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, and it grows, and it gets greater, and it spreads out large branches, and those branches then begin to produce shade for the community. The birds of the air come, and they find shelter in the tree of the church, in the tree of the kingdom of God. So I want to talk to you about some branches this morning, and, um, and, and just... Uh, talk about the kingdom and how it grows and as it grows. I also want to introduce to you some some things as we move and start looking toward 2020. Uh, we're at the beginning of, when this goes out, who knows how long before somebody sees it, but this is the beginning of November, the first week of November in 2019, and we're getting ready to move into 2020, and a lot of people are looking forward to 2020 and 2020 vision and, and new things and, and everything else. We are going to be introducing some new things over the next couple months to, to the church, some things that, are, that we have been going on behind the scenes that we're going to introduce to you, uh, but I want to lay a foundation for it this morning and just talk to you about how the kingdom grows and sp spreads out its branches. So what what are the branches? There are five main branches. They become, and note, note the, the, the term, large branches, shoots out large branches. These branches begin to, to shoot out. So what are the large branches of your life? What are the large branches of a church? What are the large branches of the kingdom that begin to spread out over a community? So I just want to talk to you this morning about those branches. The first branch is the branch of worship. It's, it's the branch, it is, we are the only people on the planet that have access to the Father through the Son. He that has the Son has the Father, the Scripture says, but if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. You know that Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus said that Father, that God is looking for those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth, John chapter 4. He's looking for worshipers, for the Father is seeking those to worship Him. There's a lot of worship going on all over the planet, all kinds of worship, worship exercises all over the planet, but the only worship that is a sweet-smelling savor to the Father is the worship that comes through the Son. Because He's the only one that He spoke over and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well Pleased, the, the, the term well pleased, it means that you bring to me a pleasure, a, you're, a, you're a, a sweet odor to me, you're sweet smelling to me, you're pleasant to me. And anyone that comes to the Father then must come through the fragrance of the Son. 
through the same perfume, through the same ointment. So worship goes up. So it is the gift, it is the, it is the branch of worship that makes us palatable to the Father. It is your primary, one of your primary responsibilities as a believer is to live a life of worship. To walk and to live in Father, in worship to the Father. Living your life in such a way that it brings honor to Him. So that when Father looks down at you, He says, You smell like my Son. The same fragrance. All of us know what it's like to be able to smell the clothing of a loved one. The, the cologne or the perfume of a loved one. Even if the loved one isn't there, you smell the, 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 the cologne or the perfume. You smell it and you say, man, that's, I know who that is. That's my loved one. I remember one time um, I was substituting and I leaned over one of these kids I wore, was wearing Old Spice. And I remember because I leaned over the kid to help him with his work and he goes, you smell just like my granddad. <laughs> and I thought, I'm not old enough to be your granddad at the point, but I that was, was generationally smelling like that generation, the old spice generation. Now it's Axe, I understand. So I don't wear Axe, I still wear old spice, but, but God doesn't, I don't enter into his presence on either old spice or Axe. I wear the fragrant perfume of Jesus Christ. Amen. So when we're singing this morning, make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. We're coming in the name of Jesus. We're coming through the sacrifice of Jesus. We're coming with our hearts sprinkled from, a, from an unclean conscience by the blood of the Lamb. We come to bring forth worship. You have been made to worship. It is, your, it is one of your primary blessings, honors that you have to worship. It is what happens all over the planet that God says, this is my beloved people. This is what separates us from all other humans on the planet. That we're able to worship God the Father through the Son so that all of the other worshiping that's going on, as sincere as it may be, as religious as it may be, as fragrant as it may be, will not be a sweet-smelling offering to the Father because the Father is looking for those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. So we are born of the Spirit, we are bred of the Spirit, we are Spirit-driven, we are wind-driven, Spirit-led. It is all about the fragrance of the Holy Spirit in and on and through our lives in worship. We use this phrase, you'll be hearing it in the months to come, one of the things that we're going to, that we're going to talk, that we talk about is being wind-driven. What's it mean? It just means that that if you take a feather and you place it in your hand, a nice light little feather, and you place it in your hand and you gently breathe upon it, that feather will react to the breath, to the slightest breathe. Being wind-driven doesn't mean that we need gale force winds to blow us about. It just means that the soft, gentle breeze of the Holy Spirit causes us to move. That we say, yes, Lord. That we worship Him. We sense His presence. When I was in Ormond Beach a number of years ago, the Wednesday night service, the minister was doing a teaching on the E. He was doing a series on Bible animals. And so he was that night talking about the eagle. And they, it was a larger church. And so the guy, they had a handler on the stage with a large bald eagle on his, the leather on his hand and, he, and a strap. And he held that eagle and he just stood there holding that eagle through the whole service while the preacher's preaching. This guy stood there holding this eagle. And, and, and the guy's got, the, the pastor has a handout with the notes. And so he's talking about the eagle, different things. And I can't remember anything that was on that handout that night. But at the end of the message, the pastor said, by the way, there's one more point that is not on your notes because I didn't know it. Until right before we came out here, because every now and then as the minister was ministering, as he was preaching, every now and then the eagle would, would flap its, those large wings, begin to flap its wings, and the handle would just kind of hold him down and the eagle would settle back down. And I did notice that the eagle did that, and he said, did you notice that the eagle tried to fly a couple of times? He said, the handler told me just before we walked on stage, by the way, if the eagle tries to fly, it's because the air conditioning just kicked on and it senses the air movement and it wants to fly. And then, of course, he went off on it. That's what we are. 
We, when we sense the move of the Holy Ghost, we want to, you know, and he went off on it. And, of course, um, it was the one point of the message that I remembered that night. Because that's exactly how we are when we begin to worship, we begin to glorify God, we begin to sing His praise, we begin to soften our hearts, we begin to lift our, eye, our hearts, our eyes, and our minds toward heaven. The wind of the Spirit begins to blow. We begin to sense the wind and the moving of the Holy Spirit, and it causes us to want to spread our wings and catch the wind of the Spirit, whatever He's doing. But listen, it doesn't just happen on Sunday morning in the worship service. It can happen in the grocery store. It can happen in the car. It can happen when you're at a ball game. You can all of a sudden look at somebody and the small, still voice of the Holy Spirit, the wind, blow across your heart and you have a heart of compassion to minister to them. Wind-driven just means being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. It is an act of worship. See, Jesus lived his life as an offering to the Father. He was the whole burnt offering. Lo, I come in the volume of the book, O Lord, it's written of me, I delight to do your will. I just want to do the will of the Father, Jesus said. I only came to do His will. Whatever He says, whatever He does, whatever that's what I'm about, that's what the church is about. That's what the kingdom is about. It's the first branch of the church. It's being wind-driven. It's being worshipers. It is, it is living a life that is holy and completely given over unto the Father. That He's not a partial part of our life, but He is completely our life. The DNA of the kingdom of God is that God is in us, on us, and through us, and that we live our life for Him. Everything becomes subservient and secondary to that. Where I work, what I drive, where I live, how I, what I do, everything is secondary to worshiping God, that my life is an offering to the Father. So I say, God, I'll drive whatever you want me to drive. I'll live wherever you want me to live. When I came to the kingdom, I was an unsaved young man at 19 years old and not raised in church and didn't know anything about religion. I thought you religious people were just a bunch of flaky people who couldn't cope with the realities of life, so you needed some fairy tale to make you feel better about things, pie in the sky. The stuff you hear people say all the time today is, I believed all of that. But something happened. I met Jesus. Amen. That will ruin your theology. It will ruin your agnosticism, it will ruin your atheism, it will ruin your secularism, it will ruin your paganism, it will ruin whatever you're in, or turn it upside down or right side up, because when you meet the living master, all of a sudden everything changed. Now I have a new perspective on life, everything has become new, I am a new creature, I see everything differently, and it became one of those Bible-thumping crazy, radical, evangelical, conservative, whatever you want to, terms you want to give, Jesus loving, why? I met him, and now all of my life, so when I came to him, when I saw my, the day that in the back of the grocery store got the revelation that Jesus Christ was alive, that he was real, I realized that my life mission on that day became, I only have one mission in life, to know God and do what he wants. It's not that complicated. Then what's your life mission? My life mission is to know God and do what He wants. It's not that complicated. You say, what do you mean? I do what? It doesn't matter where I live. It doesn't matter what I drive. It doesn't, I don't have to go after all those things. He said the Gentiles seek after those things. You seek first the kingdom of God. I'll take care of all that. I became a KI, a kingdom issue. My dad was a GI, government issue. And sometimes I'd get in the car with him and he'd go down to supply and he would requisition something. So I realized when I became kingdom issue, I was signed up into the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, he promises to take care of me. So when I have need, I go before him and I make requisition. And I, present, I go before him and I say, now you said if I will seek first the kingdom, you'll add these other things to me. So I have some need here and I'm going to bring them to you, not because I'm scared or, or fearful that you won't provide. I'm just bringing them to you. You know what I have need of before I ask, but I'm just filling out a requisition form right now in the name of Jesus. I have need of something. And I'll thank you because I know when I set, submit the requisition form, I know that it'll go through the process of heaven and it'll show back up because I serve a good God. Amen. He knows what I have need of before I ask. Amen. So it's a kingdom issue. So what do I do? I live my life under the branch, the shade of worshiping God and providing and, and living my life in such a way that I worship God, that my life is an offering to Him and your life is an offering to Him. It is also the church, what the church does, 
Primarily the church has to worship God. Why? Because some people will come into this back gathering and gather and they won't know him. Or they will be hurting or they will be separated or they will be struggling. And what will happen is, is that we will begin to stir worship and the wind will begin to move. And as the wind begins to move, it begins to manifest and minister to everyone in the congregation. And even the farthest away from God, the hurting, the lonely, the disenfranchised, whatever they're going through, God the Holy Spirit, like a gentle dove, will minister to them. If we will be a worshiping people, God will be a saving God. If we'll be a worshiping people, God will be a healing God. If we'll be a worshiping people, God will be a moving God in our lives. All we, what we have to do is fulfill our mission. We have to worship God. It's the first branch of throwing shade. The second branch of throwing shade is fellowshipping. You shall love God with all your heart, Matthew 22 says. And then he goes on saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We are called to walk, walk in community and in, in, in fellowship. This is a hard concept to get through in our Western culture because we are so individualistic. And so we got to handle it and deal with everything on our own. But God puts us in families. We are, we are born into a family and we are nourished and taken care of in family. And so as we grow, we grow in the family of God. There is the family of God universal, the first level of that application of that branch, that we're all members of the family of God that know Christ. So whether they're in Iran or Iraq or South America or the North Pole, wherever they are, there are brothers and sisters in Christ. If that's the case, then we should love them no matter what. Amen. Even if they have different political views than us, we love them if they're in the kingdom of God. They're our brothers and our sisters. There's only one church, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all. We're all one. So that universality of the kingdom of God must manifest itself in fellowship. Fellowship. And it manifests in a couple of ways. Number one, in friendliness. Just, just being friendly toward one another. Last Sunday we had a missionary here and we went out to lunch afterwards and, and talked and laughed and joked. And Deb and I with, uh, with Bob and Muriel McCulley walked out into the parking lot, and, and as we walked out to the parking lot, it was just the four of us, and Bob stopped and says, Paul, I want to say something to you. And he was very serious, and so I kind of got, you know, oh, what, what's he getting ready to say? And he, so, and he's a taller man, he was standing to my left, and he looked down, and I'm looking up at him, and he says, we have been around the world, and in churches all over the world, and he said, your church is one of the friendliest churches we've ever been Amen. in in our life. He said, they're not just friendly, they're aggressively friendly. <laughs> Listen, it, one of the branches of the kingdom is friendliness. Yeah. Proverbs 18.24 says that if a man's going to have friends, he must first show himself friendly. So everybody just smile real big, just in case. <laughs> now, some of you scare people when you smile. Some of us get suspicious when we see smiling faces. But friendliness, just congeniality. And friendliness doesn't ha can't just be to people that we like and that people that are like us and people that are believers. Friendliness must extend itself beyond our borders to every human being because every human being is made in the image of God, whether they're believers or not. That's the, the, the first level of fellowship or, and evangelism. The first level is friendliness. Jesus was called a friend yes. of sinners. It would be easy to be friend of believers. Many of us are friends of believers. He was called a friend of sinners. What's it mean? Somehow, the Son of God who's without sin, who's perfect in holiness, who has a perfect life, that is that he has not transgressed one point before the Father, has the ability to be so completely holy, and yet sinners were willing to sit and eat with him. This is a mystery to me because our mentality many times is holiness must be sour or dour or severe. In my generation, we had back at Saturday Night Live, and many of you remember the church lady, Dana Carvey, doing, well, ain't that special. And what made that funny is we all knew a Christian that she represented 
a Christian who looked sour. These things cannot go together. Jesus was a friend. He was friendly. He was not, he was not sour. If he's not sour, we can't be sour. One of the large branches of the mission of God is that we worship God. The second large branch is, is that we fellowship. And in fellowship, we have to be friendly. And then we hurt, we heal hurts. We recognize and see that people are hurting and we minister to them. Regardless of their faith level, their politics, their skin color, their background, we heal hurting people. Yes. Jesus turns and one guy says, who's my neighbor? And Jesus begins to tell a story. And you remember the story of the parable of the Good Samaritan. And he says, a guy got beat up on the Jericho Road. And, on his, and so he's left for dead on the side of the road. And while he's there, laying there all beaten up, a Levite comes by. And the Levite, who is a good Jew, comes by and he passes by on the other side. And and goes past him, and then a priest comes by who's a better Jew than the Levite. And this priest comes by, and he looks at him, and he keeps on going. Then a Samaritan comes by, this old tatted, tattooed Samaritan with long, stringy, oily hair and a motley crew shirt on, and he's and he's got a nose ring and an ear ring, and he's got a gun on his hip, and he's and he's just coming by, and you. Then when he comes by, he sees the guy on the side of the road, and he picks him up and takes him to the inn and takes care of him. Yes, I mean. And Jesus said, which one of them was the neighbor? Which one of them was the caretaker? They said, well, the Samaritan. He says, that's, that's, that's the kingdom. The kingdom is when you see hurting people, you minister to them. You don't evaluate whether they're Levites or priests or your ilk or your tribe or your whatever, whatever. You see that need and you become a servant then who serves to that need. So you fellowship. So you meet needs regardless of their faith level. As a matter of fact, if you're going to have any influence in their life, you ought to start by helping them in their pain. So it's fellowship, friendliness. Put a smile on your face. If you're a guest today, I hope someone said hello to you today. Amen. We kind of make it, try to make it a, a priority, kind of have a saying around here, you won't outfriend us. You might find a better preacher, you might find better music, but our goal is you won't find friendlier people. We will fight to be friendly. Amen. We'll beat you up if you're not friendly. No, I'm not. <laughs> you shake somebody's hand? <laughs> we call a men's ministry circle. Gather around this room. Let us pray together. While everybody's eyes are closed. <laughs> <laughs> so the first branch is worship. The second branch is fellowship. The third branch is service. It is what I've already gotten into. See a need and meet it. The Son of Man did not come to serve, but to be served, but to serve. So on the last night of his life, in John 13, when his when his, he's getting ready, he knows to be crucified, betrayed and, and be crucified. The, the disciples are all there. We know that what's going on in the upper room, one of the things that's going on is they're arguing about who's the greatest. And all this argument, all this stuff is going on. And Jesus gets up and he walks over and he grabs a basin and he begins to pour water in it. And he takes it over and has a towel over his shoulder, gets down on his knees and begins to wash feet. Excuse me? What are you doing? You, you're, the, you're what? And so Peter, of course, who is our great example of how not to do, in so many cases, we thank God for Peter because most of us can relate to Peter more intimately because we're like him. Peter, you'll never, Jesus, you'll never wash my feet. Jesus says, if I don't do this, then you have no part with me. Well, then wash all of me. And he says, I only need to wash that's what's dirty. You see, we don't be need to become caretakers of people's entire lives. We just meet the need that they have at the moment. Their feet are dirty. Wash their feet. You don't have to become controllers of their lives. You, know, you can't walk in and, and, and take everything over. You go into where the area of need is and you help meet that area of need. It's called servanthood. You see, servanthood is one of the branches of the tree. It is that the church ought to be the most serving people of 
the community, if we're the worshipingest people, we're the friendliest, lovingest people, then we're the servingest people of the community, how's the tree going to make influence? How's it going to bring shade? Because it has a servant's heart, because we're made after, after our master, and because our master is a servant, we become servants. And Jesus even said that in, in John 13. If I am then your Lord and your master... And you call me so, and rightly so, then do as I do. Because the servant can't be greater than his master. So if I'm going to get down on my knees and serve, I've set an example for you that you get down on your knees and serve. So if you're going to be a tree that makes an influence in your community, you have to develop a servant's heart. You have to let God see your need, see the need. Now you say, well, I don't know where I'm supposed to serve. To a hammer, everything looks like a nail. What's it mean? It means where you see need is very likely where your giftings and abilities line up with your service. Amen. We can't all do the same thing. I have certain giftings that, 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 that I tend to be better at and things that I tend to be worse at. I try a lot of different things. I've tried a lot of different things. I've loved prison ministry over the years because part of my gifting is encouragement, moving forward, exhortation, and that's a gifting, and I can do that. But I served as a hospice chaplain for a few short weeks, but I didn't. I, I was like a fish out of water because it's not, because I can't go into someone who's at stage four and three weeks away from entering into eternity. They're believers. You know, you check, go in the house, they're all believers and everything else. You go in, say a prayer and everything else. But I would walk out so unfulfilled because I want to walk in and say, come on, get up from there, let's go after it. Well, you can't go after it. Some people have a mercy gifting where they don't go in and say, let's go get it. They come in and say, bless your heart, give me a sponge and I'll sponge you. Give me a guitar and I'll sing to you. I'll, I'll read the Bible to you. I'll sit with you hours on end. Everybody has different giftings. So how do you know where to serve? By your giftings. How do you know what your giftings are? Well, you can start doing evaluation, but the first level is wherever you see the need, just step into where you see what you see need. Too many times what we tend to do is see need that we think other people should be meeting. As the pastor, I get that all the time. Pastor, you know what you need to be doing? Say, brother, sister, you see that need. Why am I supposed to be doing that? Well, you're the pastor. My job is to get you doing your job. So my job is to help you do your job. Have you not read Ephesians 4? So that we would all grow up together and become mature as a body and as everybody works according to the effectual measure and the working of every part, then you doing your job, all of us doing our jobs, and the kingdom of God makes increase of itself. And the kingdom cannot make increase if uh, the pastor's doing all the work. Right. All you get is a bunch of people. It's like a football game. You've heard it said before. In a football game, there are 22 men out on the field desperately needing rest and 80,000 people in the stands desperately needing exercise. <laughs> and so many times the church is that way. The people on the platform are desperately needing rest and people in the pews are desperately needing exercise. So develop a spiritual, develop, spirit, develop uh, service muscles, servanthood muscles. You, can, you can't take care of everything, it's just the feet. Jesus said, I only wash the part that's dirty. You just find the need. So the first branch is we're worshiping people. The second branch is we're fellowshiping, fellowshiping people. The third branch is we're serving people. The fourth branch is we're maturing people. It's discipleship. It's discipleship. The, the, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, but we all with open face beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord are transformed that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. This is 2 Corinthians 3.18. Transform that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord does the transforming, but how does He do it? By looking in the mirror. What's the mirror? It's the, it, it's the mirror. In the Old Testament, the, the women would bring their mirrors. It's out of the mirrors that they made the brazen labor, the brass labor. It was just a big bowl filled with water. Obviously, they're, they're slaughtering animals, and there's a lot of blood that needs to be cleaned up. So what they would do is when you would look into the labor, you could see when the water was perfectly still, it would make a beautiful image. You could see yourself in the labor. 
is a beautiful picture of the Word of God. You know what it does? You look into the Word of God and you see Jesus is love. And when you look at yourself, you realize, I'm not love. I'm not patient like that. We read the Word of God, we get the Word of God, and we see ourselves. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Some people take offense at the word wretch. That's, that's poor self-esteem. Saying things about yourself like that and calling yourself a wretch, that's poor self-esteem. I can tell you that if you look in the mirror of God's word, you come away with one revelation after another concerning your wretchedness. We have no trouble, I have no trouble singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound of Savior, a wretch like me. As a matter of fact, the more I see him, the more wretched I see me. Amen. That doesn't mean I beat myself up and live in that wretchedness, because that wretchedness then turns to the mercy of God and sees that God picks me up and sets my feet on solid ground and transforms me into that image. And I am becoming more and more like him from one revelation to the next revelation, from one step to the next step, step by step by step, I become more like Jesus. He's dealing with issues in my life, and whether it's the way you speak or habits that you have externally or internal attitudes, whatever he's transforming, he's making you more like Jesus so that you look more like like him, you are becoming a disciple. Follow me, Jesus said. Follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me. You'll look like me. Follow me. You'll behave like me. Look at me and you'll become like me. We behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord and are transformed into that same image from glory to glory. So we use the phrase word loving. We just love the word. Amen. Why? Because it's like taking a good shower. I don't know about you, but there's sometimes that a shower is just ah oh, delightful. Yes. It's just oh man, just delightful. Just get under that warm water, get all lathered up, soapy, and, and you come out of there squeaky, squeaky, squeaky clean. You just feel good, refreshed. It's just ah, the shower made the difference. My life is better for the shower. Well, if I'm going to get a shower. Go into the Word of God because it's called the water of life. Jesus is called the water of life. And I get in there and when I get in there, I just start to lather up on the Word of God. And the more I lather up on the Word of God, I come out of there and say, man, feel squeaky clean. I first went in and saw how dirty I was, but the more I looked, the more I saw the love of God and how He cleanses me, forgives me, and heals me. And did you know that every morning the mercies of God are renewed? So if God ever did invest any mercy on me yesterday, He's not depleted of mercy because He has new mercy for me today. So every day there's new mercy. So if He did have to give me mercy yesterday, which is a wonderful thing, there's a whole fresh supply of mercy today. And when I go tomorrow, there'll be another supply of mercy so if I go down to the river and I see water flowing today I leave and think boy it'll sure be dry tomorrow but when I go back there's still water flowing day after day after day if there's water flowing in the river every day the mercy of God is being renewed day by day by day by day you see a discipleship is growing in the image of Jesus Christ you ought to be a little different today than you were yesterday you ought to be a little different this year than you were last year. You ought to be more like Christ if you've been serving the Lord for 14 years. Yeah. Somebody ought to know it. Yeah. There ought to be some kind of indication. Yeah. You have met perpetual babes like I have. People that got saved 14 years ago and they're as much a sinner today as they were 14 years ago and I'll tell you what they're not. They're not a disciple. I don't know what they are, but what they're not is a disciple because the disciple is being transformed in the image of Jesus Christ. We get convicted and we get challenged, and that's frustrating and discouraging, but on the other side of that, he comes along and says, come on, let's go, we're going to go, get, go after it. I will fix you, I will heal you, I will change you, I will transform you. There's new mercy today. So you wake up one day and you say, you know... I'm not like I was. The best testimony is when somebody else comes along and says, you're not like you were. Yes. You know what's different about you. Yeah, just this past week, I was sitting with a friend at, at uh, lunch, and it was last, last Friday or when, a week ago or so, and it was just, we had two days or three of rain. It was just gray. The clouds hung over our heads, the mountains on every side, and it was just gray and gloomy. And I, I, it dawned on me. I 
hadn't thought of it for the longest time. When I first moved up here from Florida, those days worked on my emotions big time. And, and I would really go into some deep blue funks on these overcast days. I'd get claustrophobic. I, I want horizon. I want blue. I want blue. And I couldn't see blue. Everything's gray and mountains. And then and, and devil tell you, I literally would go. I would literally go. Oh, I would literally go underneath our sink in, in, the, in the kitchen and get copper tone out and smell it. I'm serious. I needed that coconut oil just to get through the winter. I would go in there, mmm, coconut oil, and then look out gray. But this past week, I was sitting there. It was a gray, gloomy, overcast day, and I turned to my friend because it just came to me. I don't, it dawned on me. I said, "You know what? Years ago, I this would have this would have taken me down. But you know, I've lived up here so long now. I love it. That's transformation. I'm different now than I was." I've lived in this environment long enough to the, where this environment and I are adapting to one another. If you will live in this environment long enough, you will adapt to it. Right. Your patience level will change. Your love level will change. Your mercy level will change. Things will change in you if you will live. That's what's called discipleships. Discipleship. So the first branch is worship. We're worshiping people and we're the only people on the planet who do that. Those who are in Christ. Second is fellowship. It's friendliness. And it's helping hurt, helping hurt people get healed. The third is servanthood, becoming a serve, becoming a need meter, meter, seeing where people. And the fourth is discipleship. It's growing, maturing, becoming like Christ. And the, and the last one is becoming a light shiner. It's evangelism. It's reaching our lost world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It is evangelism. It is the church. Do it. It is the church. It's, consciously, consistently, intentionally reaching the lost, reaching people who don't know Jesus Christ, yes. talking to people who don't know Jesus Christ, getting involved in conversations, using their words. You've heard the saying from Francis of Assisi that says, at all times preach Jesus and when necessary use words. Well, here's breaking news. Words are necessary. How shall they heal without a preacher? Amen. And how shall they preach unless someone be this, except one be sent? Romans 10 tells us. How will they hear except someone preach? And how will they preach except someone said, as is written, how beautiful on the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news. What's the good news? Jesus is alive and he, can, he loves you and he has eternal life for you. That's good news. Tell somebody about the good news. Amen. Back in my day before I knew Jesus, we used to smoke a little dope. When we smoked a little dope, we bought it. Of course, it was illegal. I don't know what's, what is and isn't illegal now, but back then everything was illegal. It was all illegal. So every now and then, there would word get, would get around, there's some good stuff, somebody's got it. They give you the name of the dealer and tell you there's some good stuff. You go over and you buy it, and it is good stuff. And there was the, big, the biggest, the, one of the biggest um, violations of that culture was if there was good stuff going around, and you didn't tell anybody. Somebody came to you and said, man, I heard that some good stuff going around. And you say, yeah, I got something. They go, What? Why didn't you tell me? Well, listen, folks, we got some good stuff going around. Amen. It's called the gospel. The gospel means good news. We got some good stuff going around. There's some people out there that are popping pills and smoking and shooting and doing all kinds of things, trying to get gooder and higher. And I'm telling you, there's a high that's the better high than any high that can be offered. It's the high of walking in fellowship with Jesus Christ. And somebody ought to be talking about it. We ought to be sharing it somewhere with someone at some time. Somehow we've got a responsibility. We've got to let people know. Let your light Shine, yes. Jesus said, let your light shine before men. So we kind of, I told you in the year to come, there's going to be some new things. One of the things that we're going to do is we kind of come up with this. This um, It came from the, the new song we've been doing last, last month or so. Believer, I'm a uh, water walking way maker. No, not way maker, but there's another one like it. But it's got the same thing. It's, it's, it's got a rhythm. So we came up with this, the five areas then would be wind-driven, hurt, healing, uh, need-meeting, word-loving, light-shining, children of God. Amen. Those five areas. Wind-driven, that's worship. Amen. 
Heart healing, that's fellowship. Need meeting, that's service. Word loving, that's discipleship. Light shining, that's evangelism. Amen. Every one of us should be trees that are growing in those areas. Yes. Spreading out branches so that somebody is getting ministered to because we're worshiping God. And His smile is on our life. And because His smile, His fragrance, somebody walks in the room and says, Boy, that smells good. What is that? So that's perfume. That's heavenly perfume. He, I've just been worshiping God. And then somebody else goes, You know what? That person was the friend. That person is one of the friendliest people you ever want to meet. See, they just—they're just so friendly. And anytime they—they—they they, they, they just are an encourager. And then not only that, but they meet needs. People, they they, they they go and get groceries. They heard that a family was, was low on food, so they just took it upon themselves and ran over to Ingalls and got five bags of groceries and took the groceries and dropped them on the door and knocked and said, just want to give this to you as a gift. And That's one of the nicest things that anyone's ever been done. Not only that, but they used to be this way, but now they're this way because they're growing. They're a disciple, so they're becoming more and more like Jesus. And not only that, their light shines in such a way everybody knows there's no doubt that they're a Christian. The old saying is, if you were convicted of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Well, what's the evidence of our Christianity? You've heard me say it before, I don't believe any Christian, any of us should be allowed to call ourselves Christians. I think none of us should be allowed to call ourselves Christian until someone else has called you a Christian. They said of Jesus that if you testify of yourself, your testimony can't be true. Jesus then turned, this is John 4, where he turned and he says, I have the testimony of John the Baptist, I have the testimony of my Father, I have the testimony of my Word, of the Word, and I have the testimony of the miracles. I have four that bear witness of who I am. So I don't have to have testify of myself. I don't have to tell you who I am. Amen. Father will tell you, this is my beloved son, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. The Word of God says, search, search the Word, the Word will tell you who I am. He says, and if you don't believe for any of that, the miracles will tell you who I am. So my question for you is, what kind of tree are you? What, what, how much shade are you giving? How much shade are you giving? Who are getting it? Right now, Holy Spirit will bring people to your mind that need to be ministered to, encouraged. They need a phone call, a letter. They need, they need you to take them out to eat. They need you to sit, have a cup of coffee with them. They need you to spend a minute with them. Who are you going to minister to? What kind of tree are you? As I conclude, Jesus said, The kingdom of God, what should we liken it? It's like a seed. It's small. It started out small, smallest of all the herbs. But then it grew up to be a great tree, spread out large branches, and began to give shade to all the earth. Would you stand with me this morning, please? Guys on Facebook, we love you. Have a good day.